that for a few minutes first, right? <laughs> I appreciate that, but uh, I know it was a deep, what I consider a deeper teaching, and we're going to piggyback off of that, because I just want to, I, I hate, you know, I wish sometimes we had two or three hours, and maybe you don't, but I do. I, lo I, love, I, I love preaching the word. I love getting together for, for, for ministry. Amen? And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, br we'll bring you a big sofa, and then we'll get together, right? Or we'll sit in Larry's pool and we'll have church. How's that? <laughs> Amen? Nothing wrong with that, is there? Yeah, right. What I want to do, let's join hands right now. Just join with your neighbor as we open up the word today. Father God, we just stand united in prayer today. Father, I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to this word that you have for us. Father God, I ask that the revelation of Jesus Christ would strengthen our inner man, that the word of God would draw us closer to you, that we would be drawn to walk strongly in the truth of your word in this day and age, Father God. And I just anoint each and every person here today to receive from your table and the word of God. In Jesus' mighty name, and the church would say, Amen. Amen. So we we talked about uh, deception, and uh, we talked a lot about it at length last week. And I won't go quite as long because we're going to have communion, and I know we have uh, some things going on this afternoon, certain young lady's birthday. So we're going to talk about the mystery of lawlessness. Where does this deception come from? And the Bible is explicitly clear where it comes from, right? And uh, the mystery of lawlessness is the progressive rise of the Antichrist spirit. And we can see strong evidence of it at work in the world even right now. In fact, the apostles even saw the work of it begin when the early church started. Satan was there right away to oppose the church. Amen? And so... Contending for sound eschatology or healthy eschatology is a very contentious thing. Amen? And first of all, let's define what is eschatology. Well, it's a noun, and it simply means a theology. It's a type of theology or any system of doctrines concerning last or final matters as death, the judgment, the future state, etc. And it is the branch of theology dealing with such matters. So... This is a very contentious area because a lot of it is, as I said in the title, is wrapped in a mystery. So we already know, we've talked about before in Colossians, that the mystery of Christ was revealed from the law and the prophets and given to the church as a revealed mystery. All matters pertaining to Christ, all matters of church doctrine and new covenant are revealed. Amen? And in fact, the apostle says they are they are administrators of these mysteries to the church as we built the, uh, the Bible, the rest of the Bible and the epistles and the New Testament. Now, the problem in this is people fight over eschatology badly. If you go on a forum of, say, premillennial versus postmillennial rapture, people crucify each other over this stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I say be very careful with that because we don't know. That stuff is a mystery, right? Now, there is a lot that what we are told... Yeah, you can turn that down here. There is a lot that we are told straight on that I believe we can build a strong framework for our personal walks. Amen? There are certain things that we do know, and let's stick with that. For instance, when Jesus says... And when he left, when he left in, in, at the end of John and went back up in the clouds, the angel said he will return just as he came. So, just as an example, right there, Jesus was taken up in a cloud. So a cloud came around him, and somehow he was taken away into the spiritual realm as a man. Remember, he's not a spirit. So as a man, he was taking into the spiritual realm. He says that is how he's going to return. So we know, and there's no argument, it's crystal clear from Scripture, that when he comes back, there's going to be some sort of cloud, and he's going to appear right as if he just left. Amen? Now, unfortunately, people preach against that. A lot, and more so lately. Why? Because the mystery of lawlessness is at work. <clears throat> Let's go to the next slide. Going to give you some just quick examples. Let's look at Daniel 7 and 25. says, 
He will speak words against the Most High God and wear down the saints of the Most High God, and he will intend to change the times of the law, and they will be given to, into his hand for a time, two times, and half a time. Amen? He's talking about the latter days. Interestingly, he's not talking about the law of Moses here, because the ultimate law, as the Scripture says, is the law of Christ in 1 John 3.23. 1 John 2 and 18 says, Children, it is the last hour, the end of this age, and you should, as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, this is the one who will oppose Christ and attempt to replace him. Even now many Antichrists, which are false teachers, <clears throat> have appeared, which confirms our belief that this is the last hour. Now, you will say, those believers, were they expecting the return of Christ in their lifetime? Well, it's a mystery, right? We also know from the scriptures, the hour he's talking about there means the age or the dispensation of the church that we're in. That is called the last hour. Why? Because it's the last thing that Christ is going to do. All the law and the prophets have been fulfilled. The ministry of Christ here. We are now in the age of grace. There's nothing else left to do except for the return of Christ. Amen? So don't, let, don't listen to any doctrine that says there's more to God to do outside of that. So we also know in, in the scriptures, he says, an hour or a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. God is outside of time. There is no time where God is. He's, that's how he can see the end from the beginning, because he's outside of it. So the last hour is talking about an age that we are in right now. No one knows how long earth time that's going to be. It could be another thousand years. We don't know. But we do know that we are in a specific age. 1 John 2.22 says, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, right? The one who denies and consistently refuses to acknowledge the Father and the Son. Whoever denies and repudiates the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses and acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So we all here have confessed Christ, amen? amen. We have the Father, amen? For those that reject Christianity, right? They do not have the Father. It's crystal clear. There's two groups of people. Amen? Those that have the Father, those that don't have the Father. You reject Jesus Christ. It's very clear. There's no doubting it, is there? Amen? So God makes it very crystal clear. All roads do not lead to God, despite what you hear on the news or wherever, in magazines and on Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> Sal will tell you, right? <clears throat> now I'm going to open up to you the meat of this teaching. We're going to look at 2 Thessalonians 2. If you have your Bibles, you can join me there. But if not, I have it on the screen here. Now in regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to meet Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, right? So here Paul's going to deal with it. Because obviously the Thessalonians have a question. What about eschatology? We don't get all this. Jesus warned us to be like the virgins and keep the oil in our lamps. They had all those teachings, right? So what do we do with this, the church is asking. Well, here Paul's going to give them a word from the Holy Ghost. And this word from the Holy Ghost is not only for the Thessalonians, but I believe it's fully intended to the church. It is why it is written and recorded. So here's his, his teaching. He says, this is his word from the Spirit. Do not be quickly unsettled or alarmed. That means don't be insecure. Don't be fearful. Don't be filled with worries. Amen? What do we not want to be settled or alarmed about? Here it is. He makes it crystal clear. A so-called prophetic revelation or a spirit that is any quote-unquote spirit that would say contrary to the word of God, right? 
Secondly, a message, right? That means, um, what he means by message is a spoken word, a false teacher going around spreading lies. Don't be alarmed by that. Don't be alarmed by a spirit. And don't be alarmed by a letter. That means a written word. It could be a book, right? Nowadays, everybody wants to write a book nowadays. Everybody thinks they're a theologian nowadays because they listen to a couple of messages, thinks they know everything about the Word. I would say 90% of the people writing books are not students properly or can rightly divide it. Amen? And you're getting all this weird stuff out there. That's how I know they don't know, because it's weird and it's contrary to the Word of God. So don't be alarmed when you're hearing all that stuff. We read today in the Scripture passage... Two guys named Philetus and Hymenius. These brothers were going around preaching that the resurrection had already happened. And it said their teaching is like gangrene. It's rot from the inside and it overthrows or destroys or shipwrecks your faith. He said, and he, Paul turned them over to Satan for preaching that nonsense. And we have that today in the form of what's called preterism. Anyone ever heard of that doctrine of preterism? It is heavy duty going around. It says that Christ returned spiritually already and there's no physical return. That the events of Revelation all happened in 70 AD at the destruction of the temple. Very popular teaching right now. They now have a university in Rochester, New York teaching this stuff. Dedicated to victorious eschatology, they call it. They, it's, it's cute little package they put it in. Sounds good, right? But it's absolute heresy. I, and, I, and I say it what it is. I lose friends over saying, I don't care, it's heresy. It's utter nonsense. So don't be troubled when you hear stuff like that. Ignore it, amen? Let no one in any way, what? Deceive or entrap these teachings that are coming out and that have come out many times in ages past they deceive you and then you are trapped by them they, they're subtle they're crafty as the word says the subtle and crafty teachings of men they entice you they look good they sound good they're very attractive right very attractive you know, I put up a, a, a I got a, someone send me a, came across my feed about <clears throat> modern Gnostics. And it looks good. You have Christ in you spiritually, so you are, you are the divine, it says. John said that was heresy, because he, he wrote, a, he wrote 1 John dealing with that nonsense going around Ephesus, Amen. So don't let anyone deceive you and trap you for that day. Here it's crystal clear, church. Will not come, okay? The day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Amen? And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, which is the Antichrist. The word apostasy means departure or implying desertion, right? Literally a leaving from a previous standing, a defection or revolt. An unbeliever cannot experience apostasy because they were never in the church to begin with. He is specifically talking about so-called believers who once stood in the truth, who accepted Christ, who will be enticed and entrapped by the lawlessness of these teachings and pulled away from their firm foundation into Antichrist teachings. And believe me, I, I shared examples last week just in my life, people who I've seen go under this stuff. And for those who are, wasn't there, two seconds I'll share. I knew a pastor. He was a sound teacher. He was preaching the word. And he got into this stuff that Jesus already came back already. And he's right. Well, I just had this new revelation. I read this teaching and it made sense. We're so worried about Jesus returning. He already came spiritually and we have everything. And I'm like, holy cow. Within a year, he got into universalism. All people are saved. God loves everybody. Short time after that, he has an affair with a woman in his congregation and leaves his wife. And now he stands on the platform that there is no such thing as sin. 
So this man of God fell. He was enticed and entrapped by lawlessness. By lawlessness. Amen? It happens. It's happening. It will continue to happen. Amen? Verse 4 says, <clears throat> what does the Antichrist do? Here's how you can tell. Watch this. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he, he enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. Now Paul says something interesting. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I was telling you things? These things? Paul has been warning all along. Warning. Because his warning is echoing down the ages of time. This word was not just for the Thessalonians. It's for everyone sitting in this room. Amen? And you know what restrains him now is so that he will be revealed at his own appointed time. Let me finish this. I'm going to go back to that. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work only until he who now restrains it is taken out of the way. Wow. There's another teaching going around that says God would never allow anything bad to happen. God is not in control. He just lets it go. Uh, and you don't want to believe in dispensationalism because that's error. Who restrains the Antichrist right now as we speak? The Holy Spirit. Amen. When the Holy Spirit takes himself out of the way, what's going to happen? The devil will have no restraints on him and will fully unleash all evil and wickedness on the earth. And this is how we know that the Holy Spirit is gone because the Satan is going to appear in a body. Amen? The Bible's clear. This isn't spiritual stuff. This is a happening, something that's going to happen. The church right now is the restraining influence on the world. God allows evil to only go so far. So when you see Kim Jong-un killing people, threatening to nuke everybody, God's allowing that right now. He's allowing that. God allowed Hitler to come on the scene. Let's just let's not get crazy with this stuff. Did God want that to happen? Of course not. Was it his will that people die? No. But God lets things happen because we wouldn't have free will. But even in that, God has a, 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 a demarcation line. You can only go so far. And when Hitler was raging, God rose up the United States and these other countries to put him in his place, right? And to bring it to an end. And this stuff happens over and over throughout the ages. Satan is constantly, never-ending, trying to take over the earth. He hates the church because we are the restraining influence on the kingdom of darkness right now. So when God takes the church out in the rapture, and I'm not going to get into the different rapture teachings. Let's, let's just understand that the word says this. When he returns, all the saints that have passed before him will become with him. And the saints that are here will rise up to meet him in the air. And we will receive our new bodies and come and set the world straight with Jesus Christ to rule and reign with him. So when that happens, there is going to be a short window of time where the Holy Spirit lifts the church is gone and the restraining influence of the devil is gone. He will have free reign to do whatever he desires for a short period of time. And you can read more about that in Revelation and in Daniel. But for now, let's just go with the flow with that. Amen? Next slide. The mystery. What is the mystery? Well, in the Greek, it means mysterion. It means a secret of which initiation is necessary, a secret doctrine being revealed or revealed by revelation. Satan will unmask himself through false, deceptive teachings and counterfeit signs and wonders. What does that mean for us? Just as the mystery of Christ was revealed to the church, right? 
and birthed the church when he was revealed. He birthed the ministry to the Gentiles and to the whole world, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the coming of all new covenant doctrine, in the same way the mystery of the Antichrist is being revealed progressively. Amen? So what does this mean to us? Well, there are several warnings the Scripture is giving to the church, and the full counsel of God gives to us on this issue. Number one, if you are not grounded in truth, be able to rightly divide the word, and are not discerning of error, you can be deceived. How many know that every believer can rightly divide the word of God? You don't have to be a theologian. You have the Spirit of God in you, and you have your Bible on your lap. Read it. Study it regularly. Let the Holy Spirit decipher these truths and apply it to your life. Adjust your mind. Amen? Renew your mind in it. Every believer has that available to you so that no one standing here, or sitting here right now, has the excuse when they get before God, well, I didn't know. God, you, you, you were quiet. You never spoke to me, Lord. And he's going to say, I gave you 66 books with a lot of information that's for you. How many know that God's never quiet in your life? Right. Now, sometimes you'll be going through circumstances. He allows for a period where he seems quiet. But you have that word of God sitting on your bedroom nightstand that you can hear from him any moment of any day. You have the indwelling Holy Ghost, amen, that the, 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 all truth is revealed inside of your spirit. You have access to. Every believer has access to truth. Every one of us. Now, if you don't, if you don't uh, 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 adhere to these warnings, then you will open yourself up to error. How many know it's not automatic? It's not, uh, nothing, it's not automatic, right? Salvation is, right? Once you receive by faith. But to grow in the Lord takes some of you, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Amen? Amen? It takes some work. Study to show yourself a workman approved. What must you do? Study. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What must you do? Study the Word. Amen? Very crystal clear. There are some things in our table. In fact, there's 850 present tense imperatives in the New Covenant or our parts of the Gospel. Amen? Now, of course, we don't work like under the law, self-righteously, but we are in union with Christ, and these, we walk in the Spirit, right? Walk takes your part, and then the Spirit is beside you to work with you. Amen? That is proper New Covenant doctrine. Secondly, <clears throat> If we are overly dependent on spiritual experiences, if we're constantly seeking the next conference, if we're constantly hungry for miracles, signs, and wonders, and that's our primary directive, you will be open to deception. I can't tell you the countless times, oh, there's magic anointings happening at our meeting. Everybody run to the meeting. And then, oh, it's happening over in Philadelphia. If I don't get to Philadelphia, I'll never hear from God. Oh, it's in Texas now. I got to get to that. I know people that jump around like that and follow certain ministers. Oh, if only God would move in more miracles, the church would really grow. If only healing would happen everywhere, everybody would get saved. Man, the more healings Jesus did, the more they wanted to murder him. Right? I'm all for healings. I'm all for experiences in the Spirit. That is an essential part of our walk. But everything that you experience, everything you long for, must be grounded in the Word of God. Amen. I am personally, in my personal life, I am immovable in this. I am not convinced by any message. I am not convinced by any spiritual manifestation. I am convinced by none of it until it lines up with the word and my inward witness. And I will refuse to be deceived because I am sober and I am vigilant. And as long as I stay that way, I will not be deceived. That's my personal responsibility for myself, how strong I stand in it as Eric Schlebus. Amen? Next, if your revelations are not grounded in the Word, you will be deceived. Just go on Facebook, right? All these people claim they, oh, God gave me a revelation. 
okay. And then this one person spouted it out, and I'm like, nope. Because I can think of six scriptures off the top of my head that refute that or are contrary to it. Nope. Oh, you can't depend on the word for everything. That's a big teaching going around right now. If I had time, I would have taken some pictures and show you some of the stuff people... I think I'm going to do that sometime. I think you need to see what's going on. Some of you do. I know Dina does. She's lost friends to this stuff already. If we tolerate and do not separate ourselves from deceptive teachings and teachers, you can be deceived. You cannot have one foot on one side and one on the other for a long time. You've got to choose. And I will not tolerate these clowns coming in here saying these heresies that Christ isn't returning and all and everybody saved. And, you know, th th this one guy, oh, why do we have to be separated by what we believe? Can't we love one another? Do we have to have agreement on everything for fellowship? No, you don't have to have agreement on everything for fellowship. But you go into heresies and this brother is going to back up. Especially when I come to you with a word of truth and then you go at me with this nonsense. My foot takes a step backwards. Paul is very clear. Have nothing to do with them. The workers of iniquity. Have nothing to do with them. That's not talking about worldly people. That's talking about brothers and sisters in the Lord who are propagating these deceptions and immorality. Have nothing to do with them. Just the way it is. That's a tough issue. Very tough issue. If we doubt and attempt to reinterpret the Word of God in lieu of our favorite narratives or teachings, we will be deceived. I love the message of unconditional love and grace. You know me. I stand on that. that love has to be preeminent in our lives. But I ask you a question. I can have all the love in the world, but will that love move mountains? What move mountains? Faith. Faith. Right? So that's just one example. You can, you can be the greatest lover in the world, and I've seen these lovers. And yet in their personal lives, they're wrecked with problems. Why? Because you haven't picked up the, feel, the shield of faith. And so the enemy has an inroad into your life. All, all these things work together. All truths together give us a picture of the truth. Like, uh, you know, M Mrs. Allen, I was visiting with them this week, and she has this big puzzle on her dining room table she's putting together. And it's maybe a quarter done. And there's huge sections of it missing. You have no idea what that is. I see some fish over here and a tree starting to come apart. And if that's you, if that's you with the Word of God, you have some aspect of what it is but if you don't study the word fully and grow in it over time in your life you will not get the fuller picture of truth because all truths together make the truth and when you put all those puzzle pieces and each puzzle piece is a truth of doctrine you then start to get a full picture of who Jesus is amen and that doesn't mean that you have to know everything right now. I don't know everything, but it means that we are on a, on a progressive road of growing. Amen? And that means you have to be the steady eddy in your life. Prayer, reading of the Word, studying of the Word, you know, communing with God, fellowship with other believers, all these things, you must have a little bit of all of it to be healthy. Amen? You cannot study the Word and not be in fellowship with other believers. Or you cannot be uh, getting high off of church services, but have no power in your life six days out of the week because you don't study the Word. Amen? To be a full-statured believer, it's the steady eddy. You're the slow turtle in the race. I have watched the people who are the rabbits, who are so full of zeal, run way ahead like this. And all, you know, all of a sudden, because they have run way ahead, they're not prepared. They get distracted. And here's a few months later, me walking right past them. Because we are to run a race, aren't we? Amen? And anything that you, if you can take anything away from today, this is very important right here. Amen? <clears throat> Watch the time here because we have communion. So lawlessness, 
That means without law, lawlessness, the utter disregard for God's law, which is his written and living word. Anomia means the end impact of law breaking. It is a negative influence on a person's soul or status before God. Again, please understand this crystal clear because we've <clears throat> taught on this. We spent many weeks teaching on this. The law of God is not the law of Moses in the New Covenant, right? The law of God in 1 John 3.23 is faith and love. That is the doctrine of Christ contained in that. Because the end of the law of Moses is what? Love, right? And so we cannot create our own righteousness, but the righteousness is by what? Faith. Faith to faith, right? But what this is talking about is the word of the Lord. All those doctrines that I told you about, the full counsel of God, the lawlessness stands against that, right? So this is what it is. It is the secretive and deceptive doctrines that stand against the logos or the word of Christ, right? How many know that we are in Christ? So who do we follow? Christ. Anything that attacks what Christ said in the spirit of iniquity and rebellion is the spirit of Antichrist. Right? This will certainly and initially manifest in attacks on the scriptures. From there, all kinds of lying doctrines and even signs and wonders will manifest the fullness of deception. For this reason, God brought wrath against all evildoers in the Old Testament times because they were operating against God. They were operating in the Antichrist spirit, even in the Old Covenant. We talked about Korah last week, right? Korah led a rebellion against Moses and tried to get all of Israel to rebel. Yes, ma'am? I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. No, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and so Korah, the, the wrath of God manifested against Korah, and him and all the rebellious were swallowed into the earth. That is a sign and example for us. Because it is much worse if you reject the word of Christ. That's clear from Scripture. If you reject Christ, something worse will eventually happen to you. Amen? <clears throat> few scriptures. 1 Timothy 4, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and in Christ Jesus, who is the, what? Judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing in his kingdom, here it is, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Say it with me. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. Turn and turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, believers, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of evangelists, fulfill your ministry. 2 Peter 2 says, But false prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce the destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction about themselves. And it talks about many are going to follow in their sensuality because the way of truth will be maligned and in their greed, they will exploit you with false words and their judgment is coming. Amen? When you get on TV and says you have to sow a thousand dollar seed to get a blessing from God, they are exploiting you in their greed. I call this stuff out. I do not tolerate it in my life. I know exactly what it is. It is exploiting you with words in greed. God has nothing to do with blessing you through money. Simon the sorcerer brought a curse on themselves, himself for doing that very thing. Amen? And back to 2 Thessalonians 2, Then the lawless one will be revealed, and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end him to an end by the appearance of his coming. And the coming of the Antichrist is one through the activity of Satan with great power, right? Those are counterfeit miracles and deceptive signs and false wonders. See where if you're one of these Christians that love the supernatural and that's your primary director, you're open to this. Nothing wrong with wanting a miracle. Nothing wrong with that. 
nothing at all wanting to see the power of God move. But if you are not word first, right? You are open to deception. That's not my opinion. Right, Joanne? Not my opinion. Be Verse 11, because of this, God will send on them a misleading influence. Oh, but God would never do anything negative. Who sends the misleading influence on them? Who's the perpetrator of it here? No, wait, go to the next slide. Oh, where do we go here? Oh, yeah, there it is, see? We skipped one, it was, it was in between. Who sends the misleading influence? God. Just say it. It's written right there. Don't be afraid to say it. God. God sends it. Don't be afraid to say it. It's the Word. And we want to say Satan, right? Oh, God wouldn't, God wouldn't do that. That's got to be the devil. God will send. Why does He send? Because the person's heart rejected Him. The person's heart rejected the truth. And God in His love tried to rebuke, exhort, as we read in Timothy, correct. And in a season, they refused correction. They refused rebuke. They refused to let go of their unhealthy doctrines. And a time comes when God says, Enough. You have rejected my word. He gives you over to the misleading influence. Because you wanted it. You wanted it. You rejected his word. You said that the word of Christ was a lie and you believed a lie instead. And he tried to correct you. This is hypothetically, I'm not talking to anybody here. Right? And so at some point in your life, God, Romans 1, Romans chapter 1. He gave them over to their desires. Who gave them over? God. Next. Even Jesus warns us in Matthew 24. See, I love the word. I don't preach my opinions. I try to avoid that at all costs. So some people are man, I had one guy, man, all you put is the word up there. How am I, what am I supposed to preach? My own opinions? The theology of Eric? I'm a bond servant. I can't do that. Amen? So that's why I like, to, I like hitting heavy with the word. And Jesus answered said to them, See that no one must lead you. Who's responsible? Put your hands up. See to it that no one misleads you. You have to see to it. Right? For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Because what? Lawlessness is increased. The mystery of lawlessness at work will increase, not decrease. Right? Most people's love will grow cold. That's the agape love of God. That benevolent love for others will grow cold and they will begin to love themselves. That type of love is called iniquity. Loving yourself over loving God and others, right? That is pride. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. How do you be saved? At the end, what must you do? You and me must endure. Amen? Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, there he is, do not believe him, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance, when the Judaizers came into the Galatian region, and they came into Jerusalem and spread a message that you must be under the law of Moses, even if you are in Christ. Peter, the elect, fell under that deception, and Paul had to rebuke him in Galatians chapter 2. So Peter was deceived. Peter stood to Jesus and said, you're not going to be crucified. We're not going to let that happen. Get behind thee, Satan. Because Peter manifested a thought from the devil. Are we 
open to that as believers? I've done it. It doesn't mean I'm a wicked person. It just means that sometimes I'm deceived. Amen? Let's not be arrogant. Yes, we have our position in Christ. Yes, we have all these great promises. Yes, we are secure in our salvation. But it doesn't mean that it's all automatic, does it? Peter was deceived as a spirit-filled believer who preached the message in Acts chapter 2. Amen? 3,000 were saved. Peter preached and started the church. And yet, here we are 10 years later, he gets deceived by the Judaizers. Astonishing. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we are experiencing aspects of the last days. Though much of it is a mystery, there is plenty enough clues and facts that we have ba a balanced doctrine in our individual walks. Not only are we told that he will return the exact way he came, we are given many other facts. I'm just giving you a quick... <clears throat> you can see all these different things. This is for a whole other teaching where Revelation 6 coincides exactly with Matthew 24, all these different signs, wars, famines, you know, m martyrdom, all these things, right? Clear events that are going to take happen on a worldwide scale. Amen? <clears throat> and finally, I'm going to end with this. Let's take a look. Here's our clear-cut sign. In Matthew 24. For the coming of the Son of Man will just will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they do not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. What was going on in the days of Noah? Let's take a look. This is what we're closing with. And the Lord saw that wickedness or the depravity of man was so great on the earth that every imagination or intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Imagine some of these situations that is going on on the earth. Anyone remember the Rwandan genocide back like 10 years ago? where a spirit of evil, they were possessed, and they went on a rampage, and they butchered and brutally murdered tens of thousands of people just for sport. There's pictures where they gathered whole towns together into a cathedral and burned them to death alive and laughed and were dancing around having fun about it. You're telling me that God is not going to get sick of that stuff? Amen? Amen. He has allowed a certain measure of it. Amen? And one day, when the day of reckoning comes, it's going to be bad. So we see in the last days, continual rise in evil. For you, how should I say, more mature people in age. Right, George? <laughs> I'll, well, I'll, I'll take Wil Wilbur. When you were a kid... Did you see the filth that is propagated on TV and radio and movies back in your day compared to right now? Just in your lifetime. Think about it, brother. In your lifetime, you had decency and you watched it go into total garbage. Every immoral thing you can imagine they're propagating right now on regular TV, at these music concerts and all this stuff, right? If a man could watch that happen in one lifetime, what is going what are my kids going to see when they're Wilbur's age? Think about it. Think about it. How much worse can it get? It's going to get much worse. The days of Noah, everybody was doing it. There wasn't one righteous person left on the globe. And it says, the Lord had regretted that he made mankind, and he was grieved in his heart. And so he determined to annihilate us and send the flood. Amen? Next slide. So see, in closing, <clears throat> there are many signs of Christ's return. 
Ultimately, the greatest sign and what we are ultimately each responsible for is to live in the truth. The key to our safety is to remain grounded both in the word and the doctrines of Christ. If we are immovable in those things, <clears throat> we will be kept safe by both the spirit and the word. We will not be partakers in the great falling away <clears throat> and the lawlessness to come. This ultimately is our basic framework when approaching eschatology, even if we do not understand all the mysteries and signs. Can you go back to that slide with the blue arrow, arrows? I just want to read those one time as we close. Yeah, it was back about six, seven slides easily or more. <clears throat> That's it. Let's, let's just one more time go through this. You have to be grounded in truth and rightly divide the word and discerning of error. Okay? One. Do not be overly dependent on spiritual experiences and signs and wonders. Okay? You go on YouTube, you watch all these so-called miracles and all that, and a lot of it's a bunch of rubbish. You must be discerning in those things. If our revelations are not grounded in the word, you can be deceived. If you tolerate and do not separate yourself from deceptive teachings and put in one foot in and one foot out, you are open to deception. If you doubt or attempt to uh, reinterpret the word of God or discredit it in lieu of your favorite narratives, you could be open to spiritual deception. I could take an, an awesome truth like grace or I could take an awesome truth like love and I could misuse love, the doctrine of it. I, like I said, God loves everybody so much everyone's going to be saved. You now went into error. You took in your, you've taken your personal narrative that God's love is above all and you've warped it outside of the scripture and you misused it. That is called reinterpreting the word of God through your favorite personal narrative. Amen? So, remember these things. Amen? I hope that you guys... Uh, got a good taste of this and can start to get grounded in these things. It's just another piece of the puzzle. Amen? Amen. Amongst everything else we've been talking about for the past couple years, this is another piece of the puzzle I want you guys to get strong in and be alert for. Amen? We can go ahead. We're going to pass out the uh, my awesome volunteers.